the nation's favourite antiques experts. I just love it. Behind the wheel of a classic car. It's fast. It's a race. And a goal to scar Britain for antiques. Could be tricky. That's the aim. The aim? To make the biggest profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. Well, high five. There will be worthy winners. Mind blowing. And <laughs> valiant losers. Could have been worse. Will it be the high road to glory? <laughs> or the slow road to disaster? Oh no. This <laughs> is the Antiques Road Trip. Dig that. Good morning from sunny Yorkshire. Oh, the oh, grand, grand old Duke, Duke of York. He had 10,000 men. He marched them up to the top of the hill and he marched them down again. Oh, I do love a good sing-song, don't you? You are quite a grand old. Not old, <laughs> but there was a grand even older. Just <laughs> be careful. Yes, the grand old Duchess Margie Cooper <laughs> and cheeky sidekick Charles Hanson on a trip to Antiques Glory in a classic BMW. What fun. It's been a joy. Oh. But there's still two more auctions to go. And they're fun, aren't they, when they're going well? Yeah. Oh, when we, they're going well. We've both done OK. For Margie, it's been a bit of a bumpy ride, but she's increased her £200 pot to £330.62, which ordinarily would be brilliant. But front runner Charlie has sailed through each auction, amassing £464.62. Don't you love them? My tactic, Margie, tactic. is to handle with a passion, to celebrate history, <laughs> and to buy for the nation, and to salute. I'm going to sing the I'm going to sing the national anthem in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't! You've got to stand up for that. <laughs> Charles and Margie started their journey in the Scottish Highlands. They ate the miles southwards across England's northeast. We'll continue through Yorkshire and Lancashire before heading back up for a final auction in Harrogate. Today, they're pointing towards a cell room in Leeds, but Margie is starting solo in Wakefield. Her first port of call is Wakefield Antiques and Collectibles. And it's a whopper, with around 70 dealers all under one roof. Huge. Thankfully, Dealer Andrew is on hand to help. Don't you love the music? It's almost the best part. So intriguing little leather case. It's a little nice glasses up. case. It is, isn't it? Probably containing the uh, glasses Nauks, itself. as they say now, around here. <laughs> <Nauks, yeah. laughs> no, it's, it's a little magnifying glass, isn't it? There you go. Oh, yeah, just a little magnifying glass. Quite cute. Yeah, we got better like that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I like the case more than the item. It's just a base metal, isn't it? It's just yes. brass. That's a thought, 20 quid. Excellent. I'm sure we could do something on that. Oh, that's a maybe then. Anything else take our eye? That bell there. Don't like the bracket, but the bell's. All right, isn't it? Typical ship's, ship's bell. Ship's bell, yeah, it's good. People like those. With probably sell. original rope on the bottom, yeah, so no, it's it quite It does nice. look like it. How much is that? I think it's um, marked up at uh, £65, but yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. sure there might be something yeah, we're able to do if you were really interested. Inter yeah, I'm quite interested in that. You know what I'm going to say? I know. Is it possible <laughs> for me to lift it off the wall? Driver. No, it's not a problem. We can lift it off and you can have a look at it. Oh, no it problem. just hooks off. Yeah. Time for a closer look, then. For doing that. No it's problem. A lot of trouble, aren't I? No, it's all right. <laughs> so it's a ship's bell, isn't it? Yes. And converted to Converted to, be to used a, in a, a house, a house. Or yeah. Or may, quite. Maybe even a pub. And it's pretty old, isn't it? No, it's definitely it's, got some age. Yeah, it's, sort it's of turn of the century. It is, maybe. it is. Last century. Yeah. Mm. Quite like that. Quite nice. Yeah, yeah. That makes me. But it's 65 quid. Well, we would have to have a word with the dealer, but I'm sure this particular dealer would is do he, something. Is he a nice yeah, he's man? he's flexible. Flexible. That's what we like to say. That's the word. So you could give him a ring for me? I'll give him a ring and see right. what the best deal is we can oh, do. Oh, that's nice. Thanks. So how's that? That's Splendid. very kind. Okay. Thank you. That's right. I think it's quite a good chance of a set. Ship's bells, any kind of bells, bells on desks. It's always a market. Ding dong, then. Andrew's back. What's the news, Andy? Right, yes, did the... I've pardon. spoken to the dealer, mm. and uh, he's had a look at his figures. Yeah. And the absolute best he can do on this is yeah. £45. I'll pay £45. Done. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> OK, that was great. Thank you very much. Well, ring-a-ding-ding. The ship's bell is Margie's first purchase of the day. Good for her. Splendid. Meanwhile, Charles is heading to Dewsbury. This historic Minster town is home to Dewsbury Antiques, a fledgling company at just two years old. But what can Charles find in here? Whatever he's after, he's not seeing it. Time to find the dealer. Dave, I had a really good look around the shop. There's right. plenty of good stuff. Thank you. But what I'm looking for is maybe more the small side. I can't any silver or Sh maybe jewellery. Yeah, is there any behind your reception counter The silver here? we keep separately, yeah. Oh, well done, the silver here. Got a few bits and pieces well done. in there. Oh, wow. Is this all one clearance or...? No, the bit, bits and pieces from everywhere. That's interesting because it's a yellow metal mounted, could be a baker light, it looks like amber, right. but I think it's a baker light. But interesting, yeah. novelty, quite art deco, yeah, quite yeah. jazzy. And these, I think, are silver, they've aren't they? Yeah, these are Hallmark yeah, yeah. Henry Adams, Sheffield, with a small B, and I think that's 1903. And then, Dave, you've got bits of plate. Oh, they're, they're quite nice, Dave. They are also silver. Yeah. That's novelty. I love advertising, <coughs> and this is a little British-made Vesta case. British-made goods are welcome throughout my dominion, said John Bull. Yep. And that is a Bullinizer. A Bullinizer Vesta case. Vesta case. Yeah. And then, Dave, I also, if I have a quick scratch around here, you've got. That's quite sweet. Yeah, it's an old football badge, that one. Yeah, there's a thing. Quite a successful rummage, Carlos. Right. Dave, I'm happy Watson there. Right, thank you. Thank you, Dave. I'm quite excited. What's news, then? <laughs> and that's quite an assortment. If I said to you, how much could the parcel be? Um, Best well, price? I do both, both of them at 30. Right. Um, do 20 on there and 20 on there. That's what I'll give you a total of 70. And 70 is your best price? It is, yeah. And from a Leeds United football supporter to a Derby County diehard? It might go back up. <laughs> David, I think for that reason, then, I'm going to put my Derby hand out, shake a Leeds hand and say, I'll take the whole lot of life for 70 pounds. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah. And that's Charles's first deal done. He has a haul of silver and what looks like a golden amber brooch. Super. Meanwhile, Margie's headed for Rothwell and to Hope Field Farm. She's here to find out about a humble crop with a remarkable story. Rhubarb, as far as the eye can see. Amazing. Meeting Margie is Janet Oldroyd Hume, whose family have been rhubarb farmers here for five generations. I always think of rhubarb as being British. But it's not, is it? No. <laughs> it's made its adoptive home here. Yeah. It's got perfect conditions for growth yeah. here. Uh, but it's a native of Siberia. Siberia? <laughs> it likes the cold. So oh, that's why Yorkshire that. suits them. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, the you could say so <laughs> on some days in winter. But for thousands of years, rhubarb wasn't eaten for dessert. It's a Chinese herbal remedy. remedy. The roots. Uh, were kiln dried and ground, and it made a yellow ochre powder that went to China. Early strains of rhubarb, which is actually a vegetable, were packed with natural toxin. Oxalic acid would kill off bacteria and viruses, and that's where it worked best, and particularly dysentery. Drinking filthy water in ancient times, they were always getting it, mm. and rhubarb was the cure. Rhubarb remedies came to Britain through the ancient trade routes in the 13th century. And in the 16th century, farmers tried to make the drugs here by growing the plant from seed. But cross-pollination by insects meant it lost its powerful medicinal potency, and so it was grown as food instead. So what does rhubarb require? What, what does it need to grow well? Uh, so it likes moisture, it likes cooler climates. Yes. But look how nature designs the leaf 
to catch rainfall yeah, and shade it. it. And protect. I've never thought about we'll it. We'll be able to use a rhubarb leaf to shade dust today. Oh, that's <laughs> a good idea. We might need it. We, we will. <laughs> In the early 1800s, rhubarb farming changed after it was discovered by chance at Chelsea Physic Garden that it could be grown from root instead of seed. The method is called forced rhubarb, and Janet's family had been growing it in this way since the 1930s. As her photographs from the farm show, roots are left underground for two years to build up glucose reserves before being transferred to sheds. Without light or soil, the stalks then grow from their own sugary roots. In Janet's shed, the current rhubarb crop is at the end of its cycle. Ooh. Oh, my goodness. They're all like aliens. The whole point of forcing is you get in it at a time when it wouldn't be growing at all. Mm. And you get in a product that is much sweeter, much more delicately flavoured than you would ever get growing it outside. The climate and soil here in Yorkshire is perfect for rhubarb cultivation and Leeds, Bradford and Wakefield mark the three points known as the rhubarb triangle. But how does the local delicacy taste? Scrummy. Do we have to talk? Can't I just keep on eating? <laughs> <laughs> so when did rhubarb really you know, become popular? Really throughout Victoria's reign and then immensely important, of course, through both world wars. Mm. And what caused the downfall of the crop was sugar was rationed and the growers went bankrupt. Even forced rhubarb relied on sugar to make it less sour. And then it had to compete with imported tropical fruits. So where there were once over 200 producers in the rhubarb triangle, today there are only 11. Today, we now have a tangy taste. Yeah. We're cutting out sugar and we like tangy flavours. So rhubarb's making a comeback for that. How can we live without it? We can't, <laughs> can we? <laughs> She's right. Now, where's Charles got up to? Margie, the sun is shining on the chosen one, and that's me today, I hope. But Margie, you're a crafty lady. I've got every faith you might pit me to the post. Charles has made his way to the village of Alton. He's visiting a vintage shop that prides itself on its wide range of eclectic and one-of-a-kind goods. Sounds very fitting for our one-of-a-kind Charles. What's caught my eye is what is described as a beautiful oak lectern on casters. And the reason I like this lectern, it's got this beautiful, slightly angled top but more than that what gives it almost a liberty look of that great time of the 1870s 80s is this style of lattice work on the side here a very unusual design and the way these turnings are really well picked out and defined just to me has a heightened quality i need to almost get on the floor and look at this properly so turn it upside down it's quite rustic. You'll see the casters are still attached, although there's some degrees of wear and tear, but it's just a very smart piece of designer furniture. I think at 120, it's just a bit too much. Best get dealer Amy. Amy? Follow me, Amy, it's over here. It's this. I quite like it. It's not amazingly well made, but it has the look of liberty and in manner maybe goes back to the 1880s. I like the top, it was a lovely, rich oak colour. Now, it's priced at 120. Is there much you can do on that for me? 70. Bottom. Do you know, sometimes you buy things with a certain designer charm, and this is an A for antique, not a V for vintage. I think for that reason, I'm going to say, I'll take it. Thank you very much. I love it. Great. I love it when they love it, don't you? But he's not finished yet. Now, over here, Amy, I was browsing this corner and I saw this. A 1920s original cast iron mechanical money box. And it is a lovely example. Do you like it? 
Yeah, I love it. What I like about it is the fact it's been so smashed up almost. There's almost Bugatti-style motor cars capturing a luxurious age of motoring at speed in the 1920s. And of course, what you do to make it work, if you, I'm sure you've tried it out already, Amy. But if I find that a bit of, um, there we go, loose change, you put your sort of penny in there, yep. you pull the car back, like so, you press the trigger on your marks, get set. Go. There you go. And it's gone. It's priced at £45. Give me your best price. Oh. Can go to 30. Really? Do you know, today's been fast and furious. Marge is my wingman, but he can join us. I'll take him for £30. I love it. Again. So that's £100 for the Oak Lectern and the racer money box, and Charles is done for the day. So bravo, old bean. I don't get run down. I think it's time to reunite with Margie. I kid you not, Margie, I think a glint of sunshine gives you and I a glint of gold in what we buy. Yeah, it gives you an energy. And profit. Do you think you're getting better? Getting energy. Tan. Margie, I'm... I'm getting uh, a little town. I'm feeling your bronze and on next to you, Margie. <laughs> I feel like we should be on the town, you know. I think you've got Living a bit... Put a little YMCA, Margie. Put a YMCA. <laughs> oh, Charles Housen. Oh. Yep, the heat's finally got to them. Nighty night. Good morning. Dawn is broken. Birds are singing and the joys of spring are upon us. I do hope they're not going to sing again. That's mine. Don't... Oh. No backwash. <laughs> they're best of friends, really. Now, yesterday, Margie only brought one thing, a ship's bell. I'll pay for it. <laughs> Done. <laughs> She has £285 and 62 pence left to spend today. Charles, meanwhile, bought an oak lectern, a racer money box and some pieces of silverware. This is an A for antique, not a V for vintage. Leaving him £294 and 62 pence in his wallet. Now, can Charles convert the mood in their convertible? What could we actually eat that comes from Yorkshire? Yorkshire pudding! I'm going to say to you, a Yorkshire tart. What's a Yorkshire tart? <laughs> like a Bakewell tart from Derbyshire. Is but, it? Um, yes, because it's in between. You've made it up. I have made it up, Margie. <laughs> well done. You win that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Goldie. Margie's dropped Charles off and is headed for Nairsborough. This picture skew market town is perched above and below cliffs by the River Nid. Margie's popped into Donkey's Year's Antiques for a good old browse. Oh, that's modern, that. that. Ooh, that's heavy, isn't it? Gosh, everywhere you look, I'm seeing really, really nice items. Hey, look at that. What a lovely thing. It's metal. It's £38. What a nice... Little buy that is. Margie's spoilt for choice in here. Dealer Simon's a helpful soul. Yeah, I'd like to show you something in here, Margie. It's quite nice. Actually. Yeah. Ah. Oh, I have. I know what you're going to show me. And I did. I've done all right in previous road trips with this. Have you? Yeah. Okay, now that's quite a decent it's, size. Yeah. Coal painted. Coal painted bronze. bronze. Yeah. How much are we talking? Well, we've. Got mm. uh, so we very reasonable. We've got a very reasonable ninety-eight pounds on it. However, I'll, I'll do seventy-five on it. Yeah, seventy-five. Um, that's a big piece for seventy-five. It is. I think. Yeah. It is. That's definitely a possibility because they do sell yeah. Yeah. well. And there's more to look at. This is lovely. Um, yeah. Chinese. Uh, yeah. This is the unusual feature about this: is Chinese. this dial. It's got all these Chinese, this Chinese script on it. Yeah. Um, the, the clock itself is probably French spelter. Yeah. Um, not the best quality. No. Um, it's all about Looks the dial. Like it's spelter, and spelter is what we call poor man's bronze, poor isn't man's it? Bronze. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. if it was far enough away on a pedestal somewhere, yeah. you would swear that was bronze. Yeah. Spelter is also known as pot metal. It's zinc based, so rather soft and breaks easily. So what is the price? We've got a very reasonable 68 on it. Yeah. Because of the condition, I can do you a special offer on that. So we, if we said £40 for that. So it's 68 down to 40 We're going to move on and finish and then make decision. Right. 
Okay. Thank you, Sam. You've been very helpful. Very helpful. And he's got Margie on a roll. Oh, I've seen an elephant. I've seen this elephant, Simon. OK, yeah, yeah, that's a nice thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a bit rough and ready, but it's nice. Yeah. And it's yeah. all there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a lovely, lovely he's thing. Got actually, bells, yeah. He's got his bells and whistles. Bells and whistles. <laughs> I've sold smaller ones with, yeah, yeah. with silver, tr yeah, yeah. you know, ha a little howder. Yeah. But this uh, is a bit more exciting than your, your average ebony, isn't it? It is. Dual encrusted. Yeah, it's yeah, thing, yeah. Bone, little yeah. bone, yeah. bone on his feet. Bone little eyes. Yeah. Nice. Oh, nice love. They are lovely actually. creatures, aren't they? How much is he? Fifty-five. Mm, um, he's too dear, isn't he? Yeah. For me. If, if I said forty-five, would that do it? Let's say forty-five. That one. Thank you very much. Finally, a deal, and the ebony elephant is hers. Is there anything stopping these two? I doubt it. I've got this for you. Um, this ca just came in yesterday. I yeah. don't know really very much at all about it, but it's, it just looks quite interesting. I Does it think. Map? Does it um, maps? I think it's Second World War, and it's showing all the airfields in the north oh. of England and mainly Scotland, I think. Oh, my um, goodness. But it's got page after page of different maps. Oh, so it's, like it's not really my subject, so I can't really right. give you much more than that. Yeah, that looks really, really Yeah, exciting. it's just something, like I said, I just don't understand it, but um, well, it just of... looks interesting, doesn't it? Does, it does, yeah. So what sort of value have you put on that? Uh, I haven't, haven't really got a clue, but um, I'd, I'd have guessed if I was to say 40, 45 pounds. Oh, yeah. I love it. <laughs> That's two deals. Now, how about the other bits she's seen? You have talked me into, I think, that clock. Talked I'm you going into? To curse you. It's a, it's a so I'm going to have the clock for 40 Fantastic. quid. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's okay. Now, the it's only a nice one thing. thing I might, to, might argue a bit. Yeah, yeah. I do like that cold painted pheasant. Could that be eased? Because I bought three other things. Go on. As soon as you bought the others, if yeah. I said 60, would that be okay? Oh, that'll be it. Fantastic. We've done it, Simon. Yeah, Thank brilliant. you very much. Crikey, our Margie's bought four things for £190. Spending like there's no tomorrow, so good for you, girl. See you later. Bye. Meanwhile, Charles has made his way to Harrogate. As England's first spa town, it enjoyed a heyday in Victorian times with the fashionable elite. Today, at the restored Royal Baths, hydrotherapy is still popular. Arc salibris fontibus. I wonder what that means. Arc Salibris, it must be Latin, I think, Fontibus. You're a genius, Charles. But there's a Turkish baths expert here, Christine Stewart. It's Arc Celebris. I apologise. Mm -hmm. And it's the famous springs. It's the citadel of the famous waters. Harrogate sits on over 80 natural springs that push up from five miles deep underground, picking up minerals from the carboniferous rocks. It's thought the springs produce about a half a million litres a day. And for hundreds of years, people have flocked here to drink and bathe in the health-giving waters. So you brought me, Christine, to what simply looks to be a tap and a basin. Mm. But this defines what Harrogate water was built upon. This is the outside tap from the pump room, and this would have been for the poor people. The richer people would have gone inside to drink water out of a glass. In fact, they would have drunk three full glasses every day. But it's not like the bottled mineral water we have today. Oh, no. Oof! That really smells. I only compare it to rotten yeah. eggs. Yeah. Well, the smell of the water is vile, as you say, but the taste of it is extremely salty, and the actual drinking of that sulphur water would purge you. Good health from Derbyshire waters to Harrogate. Good mm. health. No, 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 no. Why not? No, we're not allowed to drink it these Isn't days. Isn't it medicinal? Yes. Therapeutic? Yes. Can't I drink it? If you were extremely constipated. <laughs> Well, <laughs> or if you had a lot of worm in your guts. Well, you know me too well. <laughs> <laughs> Take a swig, Charles. Go on, I dare you. The water may not be fit to drink now, but it is still said to be good for skin complaints and general well-being, so you can have a wash. The entrance hall to the Turkish baths inside was once the epitome of Victorian grandeur. Would you like to come this way? Uh, do you know, Christine, dare I say, what a Turkish delight. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. The Islamic influence is very Moorish, isn't it? Very much so, yes. Beyond the flooring as well. Oh, and it's so hot in here. Oh, <gasps> no, it isn't. 
Why? This is the frigidarium. It's 30 degrees Celsius in here. We will be going up to 70 degrees Celsius. And that's where we're going next? Mm, when you've had a shower. Off oh, we go. OK. See you later. See okay. you Do what Matron says, Charles. The Turkish bath ritual that Charles is about to enjoy involves passing through a series of dry, heated rooms to warm and cleanse the body. Oh! So I feel a lot more refreshed after my shower. You wouldn't really, yes, you wouldn't. But it gets even warmer in here. Yes, this is the tepid arium. This one's 45 degrees Celsius. Blimey. It's really hot, isn't it? And I can really feel my pores almost opening up, and I just feel so... Relaxed. This calming atmosphere has been here, what, almost now 130 years. Mm, yes. And it really was its height in the Victorian times. The Victorians thrived on it. It was built for the Victorians yeah. and they enjoyed it, but it was very, very expensive. Was it? Very expensive indeed. And so it was only the very rich that would come in to visit Harrogate that would have used it. Yeah. Between the First and the Second World Wars, it would be used by more ordinary people, if you like, but not the common people, no. more ordinary people. An emerging middle class almost. Emerging middle class. After the Second World War and the creation of the NHS, the popularity of the spa waned. But a resurgence of interest in the 1980s led to the neglected building's full restoration in 2003. Where are we going next? We're going into the next room, which is even hotter. It gets hotter to help the mind get better. Yes, I suppose you could put it that way. Here we are. This is the Caldaria. Oh, my goodness me. 55 it's, degrees. It's like a furnace. Oh. And even on the floor now, my yeah. feet are literally <laughs> burning up. Well, you'd better brace yourself for the final room than old Bean. It's called the Laconium, and it's a scorcher. I, I mean, I'm looking at the thermometer mm. over here now, and that's saying how hot? 70 degrees Celsius. Do you know, it's 70 degrees Celsius, and I literally feel as though I'm in the back of a fire, and I'm a burning ember. Do you know, I, I can't stay here much longer. Shall we go where it's cooler? Please. <laughs> Come on. Wow. Well, Charles, I think you've earned your right to a freezing cold bath. Enjoy. It's a bit cold. <laughs> oh, it's my like hot up here, very cold below, and the hardest thing is oh, getting the shoulders under. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> now, as Charles makes a splash, Margie's back on the road. And I'm on my own in the car. <laughs> Without Charles Hansen. He's quite insufferable. He's very funny, but he does pull my leg, which makes me not concentrate. And we can't have that. So, focus, girl. Margie's heading to the rural outskirts of Harrogate to the Antiques Curio and Salvage Barn, which sources its wares from far and wide. I'm really pleased with what I've bought. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to have a look around and maybe I could pair something up with one of my previous buys to move it on a bit and get even more money. Good idea, girl. Oh, look at these. This is an old deed box. Old metal deed box, and look what's inside. Receipts and invoices. 1923, a sheep's head, three pounds of roast beef and a rabbit, and liver. And all that comes to nine pounds and three shillings. You know what you can do with these? And they look really good. I've seen this done. They actually put them all over a wall, like a wallpaper. And they look brilliant. But I can't buy these, can I? They're not going to make any money for me. Uh, so uh, as interesting as they are, I'm going to put them down and put them away. And I've enjoyed them for the last few minutes. Let's keep looking. Oh, look, lilies. How do you know they're lilies? Because she's still wearing them. Oh, here comes Charles. He shrunk, look, after his bath. What is that? What's There's what? no descriptions and no... What the heck is Do you know, that? that is something... Is it something to do with railways? I've never seen before. How interesting, Marjorie. Yeah, I think we just it's see... like a flying saucer, isn't you it? You see things you've never seen you before. fly us away together. <laughs> <laughs> to lead to be quicker than the car, won't it? <laughs> interesting, that, isn't it? You two could do with some help. Rob. Hello. What is this? It's an engineering mould, so it's part, it's part of a mould. Uh, we bought it off of a dealer in, in India. Who'd have guessed, eh? Wonders never cease.
You never stop learning, Marjorie Cooper. You can buy that if you like. Well, maybe I'll leave it for you, Marjorie Cooper. <laughs> but look, you're, you found it first. It was your spot. <laughs> Thank I was you, just Rob. curious. OK, kids, time to shop. Go, go, go. Pier glass. Great lumps of bureaus. Rob's found something for Charles. OK, Charles, look, I've pulled out a lot of old deeds you know, for you and dentures. I love old archival information and this already excites me. Mm. What I can see here, what I like, yes, we've got some later, and I suspect, just looking at how they're being folded, they're in dentures, yeah. they are uh, certificates confirming sales of land and yeah, yeah. property and tenures and all of that. I can see... There's some paper ones here, Rob, that mm. this one probably is 19th century. But looking over here, there's some stained ones. They're quite dark. And I think some even could be quite early. Yeah, we've got... We've got... I mean, we've got them going back as early as 1606. You haven't. I think just... 1606? Yeah, it's early, isn't it? So what I'm handling here is a waxed piece of vellum, which is an um, agreement between a group of individuals which is dated in the year 1664. Some of the bigger ones are quite impressive, look. Oh! Yeah, look. look at this. So here you've got this agreement or indenture, and this one is from the year 1695. And that was a year after Queen Mary died and William III was King of England. Isn't that wonderful? Mm. God, in, and you know what my love affair with antiques, Rob, is? If history could talk, yes. what could it tell us? And which articulate men, all those years ago, handled these pigskin vellum indentures and obviously put their names to them as binding agreements? And what remarkable survivors. Rob, how many are here? Ooh, I've sold a few, but the last count may be... 30 to 35 here. If I bought the whole lot... How much could they be? I would be somewhere near 350 for the lot. Uh-oh. Charles has less than £300 left to spend. I would bid you 180, 190, mm. 200, 210, 220, 230, 240, 250. Put it there. 260 in the room, look. <laughs> no deal so far. What next? I'll flip you 270 or 290. That's Fox, Charles. What, 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 what do you mean for so that? Heads, you can have it 270. Tails, 290. OK. I've got a 50p. Let's flip. Tails. <laughs> £290 it is. And Charles's biggest spend. All you can do is shake a man's hand. OK. History of history's sake, and I'm over the moon at 290. Take a big swallow, Hanson. It could be high or very low at auction. I can't wait. You risk taker, you. Gotta love it, haven't you? And where's our other love? Margie. Right, so I found some really interesting things. I've enjoyed looking round. But I haven't really found anything to add to my little cash. So I'm going to get hold of Charles, get him in the car, and we're going to drive to Leeds. And I hope uh, I'm going to be lucky. I hope so too. Done. Done. Margie, high five. <laughs> Come on, we've done it. <laughs> Let's hit Leeds. Don't forget, mirrors, signal, manoeuvre. I'll ignore that. All right. Right, you two. Get going. Going gone. It's time for auction, but first, a bit of shut eye. Top of the morning, Tia. It's auction day. Our pair started in Wakefield, scooted round Yorkshire, and have now headed to Leeds, a modern city with a rich Victorian heritage and a sale room. Gary Don Auctioneers are a family-run business founded in 1929, but online bidding is a more recent addition. Margie, you take the lead, OK? Yeah. Lead in Leeds. You lead in Leeds, OK? <laughs> Margie, the lead could be all yours, OK, in Leeds. <laughs> I kid you not. Lead, but you're leading. I'm leading for the time being. <laughs> Listen, Charles forked out £460 on goodies he's divided into five lots. You impressed, Margie? If this bombs, <laughs> it could be good for me. But, <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not, I'm just not going to go there. I'm going to sit quietly and see what happens. <laughs> Margie started with less, 
and spent less, £235 also on five lots. They are incredible. This album on its own could be game, set and match for Margie Cooper and could make a lot of money. I think I'm going down. Oh, this is exciting. Let's hear from another voice of experience, auctioneer Gary Dodd. Go, Gary. The amber brooch, uh, amber's in at the moment, amber beads are like gold at the moment. Uh, in fact, they're actually weighing amber, like they used to do with, uh, you know, gold and silver. So hopefully, hopefully that should sell OK. The Spelter Clock, uh, I wouldn't book your holidays on that. It's got a few problems, it hasn't got a back on it, it's broken, it's got no pendulum and the spring doesn't work. But apart from that, it's a great clock. <laughs> <laughs> Radio, thanks for that. Here comes our optimistic pair. Grab a seat and prepare for battle. Ready? Yeah, I'm ready, Margie. It's always a bit nerve-wracking, isn't it? Just change gear. There we go. Are you ready? <laughs> Hold tight. Up into third. Up into third. Seatbelts on, then. It's Margie's ebony elephant. 12 anywhere. All in at 12, 15, 18, 20 and 2, 25, 28. There's 28 a long way to room, go. 30 anywhere. Oh. I have 28, I have 30, 32, 32, 35. Oh, go on. 32. How about another bid here? 32 pounds on the net. 35. Oh. It's a cheap elephant. Nobody else on this. At 32. All done. Oh dear, that's disappointing. The elephant in the room. What's an elephant do when it gets noisy? It starts chucking sand around. But what sounds it making that elephant? Well, I'm certainly not going to try. <laughs> no time or place for jokes, Charles. Charles's Hall of Silver's up next. I'm starting this at fifty pounds and five anyway. Yeah. On this, I'm fifty-five, sixty, and sixty pounds and five. Oh, seventy. The bid's here at sixty-five pounds. Have a seventy anywhere? Alden at sixty-five pounds. A reasonable profit and a great start. Margie, you know what? I'm quite happy with that. <laughs> Good. You know? Now, will Margie's ship's bell sound a change in her fortunes? Twenty pounds. I've twenty bid and two anywhere. Twenty-two, twenty-five, twenty-eight. Oh, I've only 25 on this. 1900 bell. 28, I think so. I have 28 in the room. I have a 30, I have 30 on the net. Still cheap. That's 32. 32. 35. Oh Stick it outside your back door. <laughs> Ding dong. 32 in the room. <laughs> ring, ring. Anybody else? This is going well, isn't it? Pounds. Good Lord. Another loss. Oh. Annoying, isn't it? What was that? Got a burp? <laughs> Just burp, then. Oh. Pardon me, Charles next. Will his racer money box speed to a profit? Right, okay, 20 pounds started, 20 bid, and two anywhere. I've 22, 25, 28, 30, 28 in the room, 30. I've 30 and two, 35, 38, 40 and two, 42 within the room, 45, 48. Go on. Another bid there, you sure? It's got a Bugatti on. No, at 45 pounds. It reached the finishing line ahead, so well done. It's tough. I'm, I've had a small, minor profit. You have. You've made a few. Yeah, but at least you're making a few quid. I'm losing. Well, don't lose hope, Margie. Let's see how your spelter clock goes. Ten to start this off. I've ten bid. Twelve anywhere on the clock. I've twelve, fifteen, eight. Are you bidding? We bid in eighteen. Eighteen in the room. Twenty. Twenty. Twenty-two. Twenty-two. Twenty-five. 25, 28. I have 25 on the internet. All done, last chance. Well, they say bad luck comes in threes, so keep your chin up, Margie. Well, I'm having a cracking day. Yeah, but you were just warming up the big one. Let's hope so. Back to Charles now in the brooch. 12, 15, 18, 20, 22, 25, 25, 28. Looks pretty, doesn't it? So the net's going to go one. Go on. 38, 38, 40, 40 and two. 42, 45. Are you sure? Go go on. On. I can guarantee it's cheap, thank you. 45, 48 anywhere. Yeah. Uh, 48, 48, 50. Oh, you're not going to let them get away with that, are you? Hey, yeah. uh, 48. How about another couple of quid? 50. Five, Round it off, thank you. Yes, 50 bid and pounds. five. 50 pounds. I have 50 there. I'm selling at £50 on the front row. Well, that's a good profit. Well done. 
technology, my sap is now truly rising. Well, I'm pleased for you. <laughs> How do you feel? How's your sap? It's gone. It's in, my, it's in my boots. <laughs> oh, Marge, maybe your bronze pheasant can lift your spirits. I've 20 pounds bid on this and two anywhere, 22, 25, 28, 30. I've 28 here, 30, 30, 32, 35, 38, 38, 40, and two, I've 40 in the room. And dear, oh dear, this is terrible. No way. Walden at 40 pounds, I'm selling it at 40. Oh dear, poor Margie, such bad luck. What happened there? I don't know what happened. All I know is I'm losing money hand over fist. Well, I'm still rooting for you, girl. Now, how will Charles's Oak lectern fare? Almost certainly by Wybird of Liberties. I have 30 bid on this and two anywhere. 32, 35 anywhere. I have 32, 35, 38, 40. I have 42. Anybody else? Sell it at 42 pounds. Anybody? 45. 48. A 45 here on the net. Go in. Well, that's Charles's first loss of the day. Auction route is part of our journey and it can be bumpy. It can be bumpy. <laughs> to me, it's like potholes on the road trip. I hit a pothole. <laughs> Next, it's Margie's last hope the maps. Will they show her a profit? I have 100 bid and 10 anywhere. Come on, somebody in the room to get the net going. Anybody else at 100 pounds? All done at £100. A bid left here at £100. Anybody else? At £100. Hooray, about time two. You're on the right road, girl. Lovely. That's a whopper. How do you feel about that? Uh, relieved. Now, to finish off, it's Charles's biggest spend and greatest gamble, the indentures. £100 to start them. I have £100 to start them. I have £440 straight <laughs> off. <laughs> Hello, anywhere. straight in with an online bid. Four, four, four hundred and forty pounds. Four fifty anywhere. Four hundred and forty pounds. Come on, let's have another bid. Have I got four fifty? All in at four hundred and forty. Last chance of asking. Jeez, what a way to go out! A remarkable profit. Well now, Margie, listen, that top, is that now surrender? <laughs> the white? Definitely not. But... Cheeky thing. It's not over yet, anyway. Let's do some maths. I need a calculator. Yeah. Now, Margie took a downward turn with a loss of just over £47 off the sale in fees, but she's still in the running with £283.40 to spend next time. It was that wretched pheasant what did it. Charles, however, remains the trailblazer. He made a profit of £68.90 after auction costs. Well done! And he now has a mighty £533.52 to spend on their final trip. Wow! It's been a great day, Margie, on the antiques road trip. Dentures are the way forward. Now, put those dentures away. Stop clattering. Come on. <laughs> They're getting home by lorry.